Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise him like you ain't got no bills due. Come on, praise him like you know he saved you, brought you out, sanctified you, called you. Feel, come on, praise the Lord. Let, let heaven know we're here. 20 years, not, not two years, not 12 years. Come on, 20 years. Give God some praise in this house on this Lord's day. Let me begin by giving honor to God, the creator of the universe. And then I want to give honor to the one who was born of the Virgin Mary, raised by Joseph, denied by Peter, rejected by the Jews, arrested, crucified by the Romans, went down into a grave. But three days later, he got up and declared all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And one day he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. Anybody know who I'm talking about? And then to the third person of Godhead, God the Holy Spirit, the one who walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. I want to give honor to our guests of honor in the person of Dr. Felix and Pastor Katani Gilbert. And I think if I had a pastor as good as Pastor Felix and he had served me faithfully for 20 years, I probably would just put my hands together and clap and honor him and honor them. I might even stand on my feet to thank God that I am alive in the season where God sent this man and woman to do gospel ministry. And then I want to give honor to all of the clergy who are here, uh, Bishop Phillips, Pastor Dale, to our pastoral staff that's here, Pastor Brandon, to the Honorable uh, Rhonda Fields, who is here. Uh, and I would be remiss not to uh, thank our praise and worship team who gave up their time to be here. Thank you so much for allowing the Lord to use you. I would be equally remiss if I didn't pay honor to the worship team from RCF. Come on and show them some love. <clears throat> now, Felix, we got to talk about when you invite me to RCF to preach. I didn't know everybody from the city was going to be here and it was going to be this much pressure. I thought it was just going to be, you know, DCBC and a few folks from RCF. I didn't know Bishop Phillips was going to be here and Pastor Dale was going to be here and all of the state and city representatives were going to be here. And now I'm under all of this pressure. So from now on, Pastor, with all due respect, let me choose when I come. If you are so gracious to have me back. Amen. I feel like I'm on an episode of Shark Tank, and I am not the shark. Amen. Let me choose. Sunday school teachers, new members teachers, watch out. Here I come. Amen. That's, that's why I want to come. What a privilege it is to be here. And I know the hour is well spent but I don't want to rush because I don't want to get ahead of God and I don't want to be careless with his word. And so I will promise not to keep you too long, but if you'll just loosen your tie like I did, amen. In about the first 10 minutes, I knew it was going to be one of them kind of days, amen. So if you'll just loosen your tie, kick off your shoes and give me just a few minutes in the presence of the Lord to properly honor God and his word, and to properly celebrate the ministry of this man and woman. Uh, real quick, DCBC is here. DCBC, will you just stand and let Pastor Felix know how much we love him? Amen. <clears throat> and I know you're ready to go. But after 20 years, I could not 
think this is fitting, and I need a minute to just come into the presence of God. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment. A little song that I've been humming all week, just thinking about 20 years. There's a whole lot of things didn't last 20 years. And he made it 20 years without any scandal. 20 years with one baby mama. Come on and talk to me in the house. We got all the same kids and grandkids. 20, come on and give God some glory in the house. <clears throat> whole lot of things didn't last 20 years. And so let's come into the presence of the Lord today. How can I say thanks for the things you've done for me? Things so undeserved you gave to prove your love to me. Voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be, we owe it all to Thee, to God be the glory, to God Be the glory to God. Be the glory for the things He has done. Just let me. Live my life, and may it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should we gain any praise, may it go to care. Open our eyes, God, so that we may see your word. Help us not to miss the periods, the question marks, the semicolons, for they all bear on interpretation. Open our ears that we may hear what it is that the Spirit says unto the church. 
Open our spirits that we may live out the true meaning of the fact that God is a spirit. And they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Open our heart that your word may be written upon its tablets that we may not sin against it. Then I pray, Lord, that you change our mind, our will, and our volition that we may have the courage to live what we learn. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. As in the precious name of Jesus, we do pray and we all say it together. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter 3 is where I want to call your attention to. While you're finding it, let me also tip my hat to the guest songstress who was here. My God today. <clears throat> when she got finished singing, I said to Dr. Gilbert, can I preach now? And I really meant it. I mean, I wanted to preach right then. Amen. But God bless you, my sister. Uh, we are, you are a gift to us today. Amen. <laughs> Philippians chapter number three is where your theme is found, beginning at verse number 12. And in this passage, we find some of the most recognizable words in all of the New Testament, some of the most well-preached passages in all of the New Testament. But let me caution you today, don't go to sleep on me. I know you've heard this before, but I want to tell you, these verses may have been preached extensively, but I assure you they have not been preached exhaustively. So before you say, I've heard this one before, just stay with me for a little while. Philippians 3, beginning at verse number 12. And this is the record as is in the New King James. It says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. So he's reiterating the point. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which are ahead. Pause. Paul says, one thing I do, and we like to run that all together, and it gives us the impression that he is saying, the one thing I do is I forget what's behind me, but that's not the one thing he does. That's the qualifier for what comes after that. That's the parentheses, if you will. The one thing I do is found in verse number 14. He says, I press toward the goal. You're probably more familiar with the old King James that says, I press toward the mark. But he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call or the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Help me, Holy Ghost. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. The Lord bless you. Just for a few moments this evening, I want to speak from this thought. Keep running. Your best days are ahead of you. Keep running. Your best days are ahead of you. Help me make a little touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Keep running. Your best days are ahead of you. Look at your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. 
Okay, they have sleep, so push them. Say other neighbor. Push them, other neighbor. Now look back at them. Say, I heard you, but you better not push me no more. Just, just tell them. But tell them, say, your best days are ahead of you. Now look up here. Say, Dr. G. Sister G. Keep running. Your best days are ahead of you. With the first pick of the 2003 draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers selected a young boy from Cleveland. And when the conversation heats up about who is the greatest of all time, like it or not, you will have to include his name, LeBron James, in the conversation. I am not saying he is the best of all time. I would not share that opinion with you. Everybody with good sense knows Michael Jordan is the best of all times. All the rest of you heretics need to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. But when the conversation begins, you will certainly have to include his name in the conversation. By any standard that you apply to LeBron James, he is not only a great basketball player, but he is a world-class athlete. So as I prepared for this message, I took the liberty to look up and see if I could find anything on his workout routine. And let me tell you, I found more than I cared to read. I got tired just reading his workout routine. Now, everything that I'm about to say to you was not just simply this or that. It was like three sets of this change, three sets of that change, three sets of that again. It was not just one repetition. But you found things like push-ups, pull-ups, dumbbell snatch, Single arm cable rolls. What in the world are single arm cable rolls? Swiss ball hip raises, leg curls, dumbbell squats, dumbbell step ups, leg standing dumbbell calf raises. Anybody tired yet? Lat pull downs, dumbbell bench press, overhead press, dumbbell row, dumbbell side lunge, unstable jump rope. Now, when you got feet as flat as mine, jumping rope is unstable anyway. But he sees the need to make it harder than it is. I don't know this to be true, but it has been said to me that LeBron James spends upwards of about a million dollars a year on his body alone. I wish somebody saw where I was going with this. Why does he do that? Because he knows that for 82 games a year as a minimum, he will have to run up and down the court for four quarters as a minimum. And world-class athletes understand that if you are going to participate and win, you must be in good shape. Christians need to understand that we too are running a race. And if you are going to run and finish and win, you must be in good shape. I'm not worried about your calves now. When we talk about Christians, I'm worried more about your knees. It's hard to stumble when you're on your knees. I wish I had some old school in the house. But if you're going to run and win, you have to be in good shape. You've chosen this for your theme. And the Apostle Paul is drawing a bit of an analogy to what it means to run the race. And not only to run, but to win. Let me pause right there and just put a pen. This is not even in my notes. I'm going to give it to you for free. When you are a follower of Jesus, let me give you a word of encouragement. You are not running for victory. You are running out of victory. Let me say it a different way. The battle has already been fought and won. 
So you are not running to win. You are running because you have already won. Is there anybody in the house with me today that knows I've been crucified with Christ? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So the life I live in the flesh, I live now by faith in the Son of God. It's not my life. It's his. And so now I am walking out history on the way to my destiny. Let me say it again. I am now walking out history on the way to my destiny. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, all of those verbs in Greek and English show up in the past tense. So let me echo the words of the songwriter, it's done. What I shall be, I already am. It's done. In God's eyes, we are already glorified. But that's not what I came to preach. So let me just get back to this text. Keep running. Your best days are ahead of you. Step into the text with me today and let's see what we learn from the Apostle Paul as he deals with this idea of running the race. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Help me, Holy Ghost. Paul's assessment of his current position. Look in verse number 12. He says, not that I have already attained. He assesses where he currently is. And not only does he assess it, he is sober-minded about it. This sober-minded view of where one is is vital because it informs what you do next in light of the objective. Paul's objective was singular in focus. His objective was to please and see Jesus. And so once you have the objective, the very next thing you must do is assess where you are. Now, as I was preparing this message, I found myself tempted to say what I would bet some of us are already thinking, which is you cannot know where you are going until you know where you are. Let me respectfully disagree with you. I don't think this is the case. I don't have to know where I am to know that I need to go to Washington, D.C., If that is the objective. However, I do have to know where I am to know how to get there. So Paul assesses his current position about two things. One, his possession. And two, his person. Look at it. He says, number one, I have not attained. Now this word is to grasp. To acquire. This is possession. And then he says, nor am I perfected, which means to complete or to finish. This speaks of the development of his person. So he gives a sober-minded assessment of his position in two areas. What he possesses, which he says, I don't have it, and where he is. I'm not there. Can I say it in plain English? If I can, say amen. Amen. This is what Paul says in essence. I am nothing and I don't have anything yet. Now, if you read Philippians chapter 3, human reasoning could say otherwise. If you go back to verses 5 and 6, you will read Paul's vita. You will read his resume. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee of Pharisees. In verse number 6, he says, concerning zeal, I'm a persecutor of the church. And as it relates to the law... I am blameless. And a man who is intent on fulfilling 
the purpose of a self-centered life could easily look at Paul's pedigree and say, Paul, what do you mean you don't have it? You got it. You're circumcised of the eighth day. You, you're, you're of the tribe of Benjamin. You're of the stock of Israel. See, God measures success and status different from the world and how we measure success and status. The world says, get all you can and keep all that you have. God says, if you really want what's valuable, let me tell you what you do. Sometimes you've got to go sell all that you have and then pick up your cross and follow me. God looks at success different than we look at success. Why is that? Because oftentimes God has plans in mind that we don't necessarily have in mind. I listened to Pastor uh, Bishop Phillips when he was talking about the history of Pastor Gilbert. And one might wonder, why would you leave success in Arizona to come back to Denver? And one might wonder, why would you leave that church that you can see and know for the unknown? Can I answer that? Because God measures success differently than how you and I measure success. We measure it by what we can see. But God measures it by what you cannot see, but what he can see. Eyes have not seen, ears has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men what God has prepared for those who love him. So that's what this is all about. And that's what Paul is saying when he says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. So he examines his position with respect to his possessions and his person. And then when you come to the bottom of verse number 12, you see him poised to fulfill his purpose so that he might win his prize. Is that not what he says? He says, I'm pressing that I may lay hold of that. That's the prize for which God has laid hold of me. That's purpose. Let me say it a different way. If you want the prize, you've got to fulfill the purpose. If you want the crown, you've got to carry the cross. Are you in the house with me today? You were saying it earlier, Bishop. A lot of people want the stars, but they don't want the scars. And after 20 years, Pastor, you've endured some scars. And now you've got a right to look at a few little twinkling stars that God has placed in your crown. But you don't get the prize until you fulfill the purpose. Are you in the house with me today? So let me sum up verse number 12 as I move on. We've got to accurately assess our position as it relates to possession and person. And then we are poised to fulfill our purpose and to earn our prize. Here's the second thing I want you to see. He says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And then he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Paul is looking in the right direction. Or in the words of your theme today, he is anticipating the future. Now, the common exhortation when we look at this verse and Paul talks about forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which are before, the common thing that we want to say to the people of God is this. Don't rest and get comfortable in what has been. I was conversing with Pastor Brandon one day and we were talking about church and the dynamics of church. And, uh, and some of the difficulties of church and moving forward. And he said, he said, Pastor, every church has had their heyday. And sometimes when churches don't want to move, don't want to change, we were talking about a specific context in that conversation, don't want to move forward. He said, because they are bent on getting back to their heyday. 
and that was good wisdom for what I was dealing with in that moment. And that's a good exhortation. I don't think it's wrong to make that application from this text. But that's not what excited me when I read the verse. I am aware not to rest on the laurels of the past. But when Paul said, I forget those things which are behind me, and I reach forward unto those things which are before me, I got more excited about that. Because listen, there are some memories that I am thankful for, but there are some that I'm thankful I have permission to forget. Is there anybody in the house other than me that would say, thank you, Lord, I don't have to remember that. Thank you, Lord, I don't have to go back there. I am grateful for the exhortation not to rest on the past, but I am thankful that there are some things I can bury, I can put it under my feet, I can forget about it, and I can move forward in the victory that has been prescribed. So let me tell you, Pastor, if nobody's told you some things you got permission to forget. There are some places you're not taking me back to. There's some, y'all are tired, so I might as well go ahead and preach. I'm waiting for you, and you're making me nervous, so let me just move forward. There are some places you're not taking me back to. There are some things I'm not revisiting with you. There are some conversations I'm not having anymore. There are some addresses I don't live at anymore. There are some places I'm not going back to anymore. There are some people who are no longer a memory in my life mind. I have put that to bed. Thank God for his deliverance. Thank God that he moves us forward. Thank, thank God that he doesn't leave us where he finds us. Thank God that you, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away and behold, all things become new. Are you in the house with me? We don't get our prize without fulfilling our purpose. And some things you have permission to forget about. Let me encourage you. When you think about the successes of your past, have you ever stopped to think about that your best days are ahead of you? And let me tell you something else. Thank God that some prayers he did not answer. If God had answered the prayer of who you wanted to marry, right now we'd be raising bail for you, taking you to check with your probation officer, parole officer. We'd be making all kind of arrangements for you. Thank God there are some prayers that he did not answer. Thank God there are some things that he did not answer. Give to me. So let me ask you. Let me ask you about you. Are you looking in the right direction? Where is your focus or on whom is your focus? Because let me tell you something. The ability to leave things that are behind you. In one sense of the word, that's a definition of grace. God loved me enough that the stains, sins, shortcomings of the past are no longer attached to me. Are you in the house with me today? Now, for those of you who are particular about word choice, I hear you talking and asking, preacher, do we really forget do we really forget what happened to me? Am I really supposed to forget what they did to me? Am I really supposed to forget the fights that I had to come through? Am I really supposed to forget the people that came against me? So let me be clear. When I say you've got permission to forget, I am aware that there's a pretty good chance that you don't literally forget. But that's not what Paul nor I am saying. When I say we have permission to forget, I am saying your mess ups have been cleaned up on the cross of Calvary. And because your mess ups have been cleaned up, you now have permission to move up. 
And that's the mission of the church, to compel men and women to love and follow Jesus. And that's the message of the church, that your mess-ups can be cleaned up. Anybody in the house with me can look and say I had some mess ups, but thank God he cleaned them up. I don't smell like the stuff that I've been through. I don't look like the stuff that I've been through. I don't act like the places that I came from. I don't mimic the people that raised me. Why? Because God cleaned up some of my worst mess ups. Help me, Holy Ghost. Not only is Paul looking in the right direction, but he's looking at the right thing. Look at verse number 14, and I'm almost done. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the goal for the prize. I press toward the goal for the prize. He did not say, I press toward the prize. He said, I press toward the goal for the prize. Let me pause right there and see if I can illustrate this point. Uh, nothing about me was made to run. Every year, we've got to take this PT test, physical training test in the military. And uh, when they tell me the day that I have to take my PT test, I start speaking in tongues and rebuking the devil in the name of Jesus. It's a setup. My feet are flat. My waist is too big. Nothing about me was made to run. But recently, I was watching... I was watching this, I think it's the 4x4 four four relay. And I was watching these colleges uh, down south. It was LSU, it was uh, Texas A&M, it was Prairie View. Of course you know, I don't have to say, that the Texas teams were winning. I don't even have to say that. <laughs> that goes without saying. But I was watching them. I was watching them. On the track... There were, uh, there were four men who were running, and I'm almost done. Just give me ten more minutes. There were four men who were running. Off to the side of the track, there, were, there was the booth where all of the medals were held. I press toward the goal for the prize. Not I press toward the prize. I watched them come around the track one after another, handing off the baton. And every time they handed the baton from one man to the next man, and he would start out of the gate. Watch this. He did not run toward the place where they were holding the medals. He was looking toward either the next man or the finish line. What am I trying to say? The goal of the race was not to get the prize or to run toward the prize. But if I run a good race, then the prize is the byproduct of running a good race. Are you in the house with me today? What am I trying to say? There are some people in this business who want the prize, pastor, but they don't want to run the race. So let me tip my hat to you that you've spent 20 plus years running the race. It's the good race that takes you to the prize. Let me tell you something else. There ain't no shortcuts. Not only are there no shortcuts, but you got to stay in your lane. That's three weeks worth of preaching right there. Because the goal isn't the prize. The goal is to condition so that you can run the race. 
I think I read somewhere in the back half of the book that says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us so that we may run the race with patience or with endurance. And here's the challenge for some of us. We cannot run the race because we are either preoccupied with the prize or we are encumbered with the foolishness. So we can't run the race because we got weights. We got weights. We got, we got stuff on us. We got stuff in our pockets. We got weights. We got weights. We got weights of sin. We got weights of addiction. We got weights of strongholds. We got weights of hangups. We got weights of unfaithfulness. We've got weights of doubt. We've got weights. We've got weights. We've got weights. So we can't run the race. And here's what Paul says as I try to head toward a close. He says, look, all that other stuff, and you have to read the passages before this, but he says, all that other stuff, I count it loss. Now, you don't see it in the English, but in the Greek New Testament, he says, I count it as dung. Uh, I, I want to get invited back. He says, I count it as excrement. Some of y'all still miss it. I count it as a baby's dirty diaper. What you mean, Paul? You mean you count your, the fact that you are from Israel, the fact that you are uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, the fact that you were a master persecutor of the church, that you were the big dog, that you were a professor. He says, look, I count it all as loss for the cause of Christ. I have but one focus and one focus only, and that's to see Jesus. See, we don't sing songs like this, but in the old church, they would sing songs that say, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. Thank the Lord for his saving grace. I want to see Jesus. I've got a father there. I've got sisters there. I've got a brother there. I've got a grandmother there. But I want to see Jesus. Give him praise in the house. He's the prize. I'm almost finished, but let me give you this. When, when a runner runs a race, they're not running toward the prize. They're running for the goal. Now, you got to see this, though. I'm trying to quit. You got to see this. He says, I press. Stay with me now. The idea of pressing, it's the idea of a muscle strain. What does that mean to us? How do we live this muscle strain? It's an active commitment to your calling. Let me see if I can use another sports analogy. I, I, like, like I'm not made for running, I know nothing about baseball. But here's what I do know. This idea of pressing, you see it, you see it in real time in baseball. Batter steps up. He steps up to the plate. Pitcher throws the ball. He hits the ball. He hits a ground ball to the shortstop. The job, the job of the shortstop is to get the ball to the first baseman who must be touching the base before the batter gets to the base. Thank you. But now, to get the ball, he's not standing there casually. He's not there like this, waiting on the ball to come. He's not chewing gum. He's not looking elsewhere. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. He's focused because he knows that his job is to stretch 
and strain and to reach for the ball so it can get to his glove before the runner gets to the base that he must be touching. What am I trying to say? For some of us, we're not moving forward because we don't want to put no elbow grease in. We don't, we don't want to put no work in. We just want to... We want to sit back and wait for it to come to us. But Paul says, I'm not waiting for it. I'm stretching for it. I'm pushing forward. I, I got somewhere to go. I got stuff to do. I got people to share the gospel with. I'm, I'm straining for it. I need to talk to somebody for 10 seconds just for a minute that's straining for it, that says, that says where I am now, I don't always want to be. What I'm doing now, I don't always want to be doing, but I'm You get a better picture of it in the Gospels. The woman who was trying to get to Jesus, she wasn't casually meandering through, but she was... She was pushing her way through. She had somewhere that she was trying to get to. I pressed toward the mark for the prize. So, so we forget what's behind us in 13. Help me, Holy Ghost. We press toward what's in front of us in 14. We forget what's behind us, and we press toward what's in front of us. So let me give you just one more thing. We forget what's behind us. We press toward what's in front of us. That lets us know that both our mind and our body have to be engaged in this fight. Our body and our mind and any athlete will tell you running well and winning is not just being in good physical shape but you got to be in good mental shape yeah yeah let me say that again pastors don't just have to be in good physical shape but they got to be in good mental shape now I know you out there can't say amen to that because you never met you Come on, let's just get real with it. But when you've, listen, I've met me. And you ought to be honest enough to, to say that you ain't always all that you're cracked up to be. We got to be in good mental shape and we got to be in good physical shape. We got to have our body and our mind engaged in the fight of pressing toward the goal. So people will drive you crazy, but pastor, press on anyway. Yeah, when you've got to pray at night by yourself, press on anyway. When you're going to get people out of jail that deserve to be there, press on anyway. Come on and talk to me. When you're at the surgery center and you should be sleeping, press on anyway. Because there's a prize that I'm working toward. I read somewhere in the back half of the book, Be Thou Faithful Unto Death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Here it is. Paul, not only is he heading the right direction, looking at the right thing, but this very last thing, and I'm done, he has a clear end in mind. He says, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is this upward call? I looked at it and I examined it and I had to conclude after looking at it, I simply believe this upward call is literally heaven as a result of the bodily resurrection of the saints of God. Isn't that something? Read it when you get a chance. The verses that come before it. We're pressing toward new cars, new houses, new jobs, new titles, new promotions. 
bigger churches, bigger expense accounts, more places to preach, more places to teach. Paul said, listen, you can have all of that. Here's what I want. I want to see Jesus. And when the resurrection happens, he literally says in verse 10 or 11, I will do anything to be there. Where are your priorities? What are your priorities? In verse 10, he says, he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. In verse 11, he says, by any means necessary that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then in chapter 1, he spent a good portion of the chapter wrestling with the choice of staying on earth or dying and going to heaven. He said, I'd rather be there. But for your sake, I'm here. Oh, restoration, that's a good place for you to say amen. It's a whole lot of Sundays that I'd rather be somebody else. But because God has called me to this, for your sake, we're here. Now, if you can't say amen, you're probably that person that come to church 1.4 times a month. And when you do come, you come at 11 o'clock and we started at 10. You come at 11 like we started early. You just better keep saying amen or the person next to you going to know who I'm talking about. He was focused on something higher, holier, and more heavenly. So what does this teach us? I'm glad that you asked. It teaches us don't forget why we run. Don't forget why we do what we do. We don't run to impress the masses. We don't run to have our name called, but we run to be faithful. The word tells us, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. We run for the prize of the high calling. We run in the words of the old songwriter to meet the king. Now, I know some of us don't say that, uh, don't know that song. But not too long ago, a lady by the name of Dr. Maddie Moss Clark, she was was a worship leader in the Church of God of Christ. She wrote a song that said, I'm running to meet the king. And let me just close with this. She said, I'm going to walk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to sing for the heavenly king. She says, I want to be there. And the chorus would say, when they march around the wall. I want to be there when the general roll is called. They tell me that the half has never been told, but the Holy Ghost took control. I'm going to walk for the Father, sing for the Son, shout for the Holy Ghost. God, three in one, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm going to meet the king. Is there anybody in here that will finish with me tonight and say, heaven is my goal. Above all else, I want to see Jesus. Above all else, I want to stand around his throne. Above all else, I want to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to join with the angels that you were talking about, Brandon, when we cast our crown at his feet and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Give him praise in the house. Keep running. Your best days are ahead.